from Wall Street to Main Street to help small business owners have the same capital as corporate America and give them the same resources as a larger company. We cover business funding, business credit, scaling, business consulting, and much more. Check out the website at shieldadvisorygroup.com. Welcome to the show. The Liquid Lunch Project. Hey, welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Liquid Lunch Project. I am Matthew Meehan, alongside my partner, Luigi, the professor, Rosa Bianca. What's going on, Lou? Matthew, good afternoon to you and our audience. And guys, we finally got it right. After dozens and dozens of tries, we finally have a guest who speaks the proper English. Today, we have Steve Sims, author, coach, entrepreneur extraordinaire, motorcycle enthusiast. I mean, the resume just keeps going on and on. Steve, welcome to the Liquid Lunch Project. It is a pleasure to have you here, sir. I'm thrilled to be here. You know, if, if the interview is anything like what we've just been chatting for the, I don't know, hour beforehand, it's going to be fun. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. So, Steve, before when we were speaking, before we started actually recording, you know, uh, you started to tell us you're not originally from the States, which is a shock to me. Um, <laughs> so why don't you give us a little background on who you are and where you got to be right now? Damn. All right. So I'll try and keep it brief uh, because to be honest with you, it's boring and it's just the same as every other entrepreneur listening to this. Um, I grew up in East London, son of a bricklayer. And so basically left school at 15 onto a building site. And I thought, is this it? Is this really my life? And of course, in the 80s, I wasn't fortunate enough to have Instagram to point out how, how inadequate my life was. So it was just a gut reaction that surely there's got to be something better out it. And as I say, that's why it's boring. All entrepreneurs get to that moment where they go, hang on, does this really have to be how it's done? Or do I really have to live like this? So I just went out on a journey to try and find a better life for me. They quite simply had money. At the time, I thought I was poor. And I'll come back to that word, thought I was poor. I wanted money. Everything was about the money. Get me the money and my life will be good. And let's be serious. A lot of us have that mistake in our life that we think, hey, once we made a million, oh my God, everything's going to be great. And then you get to a million and you go, fuck, I'm still broke, you know? So it's, it's that kind of thing. But I went off on a journey to try and find rich people. And I tried every job from stockbroking, yacht charters, insurance, everything I tried and was fired from really, really quickly because I was just terrible at it. And I ended up getting a job in Hong Kong as a doorman. And in the lowest ebb of my life, thinking I've gone from a skilled profession, which is a bricklayer, to now a job description to just slap people. I thought, no, no, no. I can't believe my life is so bad. But from that front door, I got to see how people used to interact. It was probably the best psychology class that you could ever get being on the front door of a nightclub. So I started helping out the richer people in the club to get into other clubs or parties that they hadn't been invited to just so I could get a half hour conversation with them. Hey, Matthew, did you enjoy the party I got you into last night? Oh, I wanted to ask you, what do you do for a living? How did you get into it? I wanted to interview people. Now, if podcasts had been going back then, I probably wouldn't have ended up doing what I do. But I went from getting people into parties to throwing parties to ending up working with the richest, most powerful people in the planet. And I only ever invited rich people to my events because I didn't want to invite poor people because I knew what being poor was like and it stank. So if I could surround myself with 50 billionaires and just go, hey, Johnny, how do you do this? And then get the information from them. That was my Trojan horse. What accidentally happened was for 25 years, I launched the world's leading experiential concierge for the richest people in the planet. And we worked with Elton John, Elon Musk, Richard Branson. Uh, uh, didn't work for Jeff Bezos, worked for Richard Branson's mum. Uh, worked for a whole ton of people. But um, rich people that you've never heard of, people that own like all the shopping malls in St. Petersburg, Russia, or the biggest casinos in Macau, people that you would never know of, but absolutely are loaded and are billionaires. And then four years ago, wrote a book, um, not thinking anyone would believe it, and it just took off. And now I speak and coach and live here in Los Angeles. Welcome to the States, Steve. Oh, thanks for having me. Actually, on that note, I gained citizenship probably about four months ago. So I'm now UK and British, uh, UK and American. Congratulations. Thanks. I see, Thank you. Very proud. 
I see you're having some difficulty learning American. Yeah, I am. I am. But I'll, I'll try. You know, every time I say that I'm going into my garage, they're like, no, it's garage. You know, so I'm having to put up with that shit. <laughs> so, Steve, an entrepreneur comes to you. You've seen it all, right? You, you've, you've entered many facets. What gives you the right to coach another entrepreneur? Oh, that's easy because I'm a failure. Um, I love it. I love it. You know, I've, I've failed at so many points in my life that I've learned the education on how to do it. And I've ended up going from not being able to get into a nightclub to end up working with Naris, the Kentucky Derby and the New York Fashion Week, Piaget Cartier. We could name drop forever. So I know the pitfalls along the way. I know what they're really looking for rather than what they're asking for. And more importantly, I know what the entrepreneur needs rather than what they think they desire. So I'm able to get into a, an entrepreneur's head, give them a shake up and they come and they go, hey, I want to do this. And you just look at them in the eyes and you go, why? What's the point? What's that going to do? What needle is that going to move? Yeah, and then actually start grilling them down to find out what is causing that question to come forward and then start attacking that core. That's why I'm good at what I do. Now, Steve, isn't business at every level, at the end of the day, just interacting with people and making that connection to people? So if I think about it, you being the doorman at an elitist club, was probably the best training you could ever have. 100%. Without the art of communication, you're still bankrupt. You see, you need a client and you've got to be able to communicate. You may be communicating through the digital world. And if you're selling a, a $9.99 you know, product, that's fine. But again, think of McDonald's. You've got to communicate with a person just to order the burger. If the person on the other end can't do that, then you've got a problem. So communication is the skill that you still can't download an app for and sadly, the one that we're getting really lazy and bad at. So if you can communicate with people and actually get into what they're after, what they need, what they desire, and then start suggesting things outside of the transactional society that we are in, that's where you breed the loyalty without the requirement for bribery points. So, Steve, now we're, we're at a bit of a transition because you and I seem like we're pretty close in age. Matt is maybe just a smidgen younger than us. But the new generations, they communicate in a very different way. You know, they don't really write emails and write letters. So explain to us, what's this next level of communication for business? Yeah, I'm not going to hang it on the young of age. I'm going to hang it on the period that we're in. Um, if you think about Siri, in fact, there was a report done and it scared the shit out of me. A report was done, and I think it was either Stanford or MIT, that did a report that the average teenager spends more time speaking to artificial intelligence than it does their best friend. And I thought, that's ridiculous. That's got to be bullshit. And then I read the report because they are constantly going, hey, Siri, Alexa, you know, and they're constantly barking out these orders. Those seconds combined, they may speak to their best mate for an hour on the phone once a month. But they'll spend like three hours speaking to Siri and Alexa. We're in that short form communication now where we are used to barking orders. Hey, can you turn the music up? I'll, I'll, take, a, I'll take a burger. Oh, I need some toilet roll. You know, we're in a barking society of short transactional requests. The long form of, hey, how's your day doing? Or like we were the, before we started the show, just having a chat and feeling each other out, getting the temperature. And they don't do that now. So the, the period we're in now... Well, we are being taught to speak less. We're also being taught to speak fearfully. And that's the danger. And I'll explain that. Through COVID, not only did we have mass distraction and distortion, we had an immense lack of clarity. We didn't know when it was going to end. But just for argument's sake, we all got shut down at March last year. Just for argument's sake, if someone had said, oh, by the way, on June the 3rd, this all goes away. You'd have started painting your house. You'd have started learning French, you know, the piano. Learn. You'd have known when it was going to end. So you'd have made it more impact with your time. But we didn't have that. So a lot of people just stood on the sidelines and got scared and started screaming and binge watching Netflix. But during that time of mass distortion with COVID, we had the most polarizing political upheaval that we've ever had. Okay. On top of that, we had Me Too campaign. We had Asian hate. We had Black Lives Matter. 
there was a lot of shout going on and a lot of people being vilified for what they tweeted in 2001. So today, not only have we stopped communicating with people and we've come into short form communication, we're scared of what we say in case it gets taken out of context. People are scared to say things today. And I hate to rant, but if you've got a problem with someone or you don't understand something, now's the time you put your hand up and go, hey, Matthew, I don't understand your position. I don't understand your politics. I don't understand your view on that. Can we discuss it? People are actually getting frightened to have conversations today. And that's terrible. I did a, uh, an event a while ago, a corporate event, and it was on communication. And we started the morning's uh, training by taking everyone down to Starbucks, okay? It was at the bottom of, of that building. We took them down to the corner of Starbucks. I said, okay, we're all going to sit over here. Two of you go up at a time, order your coffee, and then instigate a conversation with the person next to you. And they were like, you know what? And we went, try it. And if you want to get arrested like you're trying to be a rapist or something, you try that, okay? Because this is what happens. You walk up to the barista in Starbucks, you order your mocha frappe or whatever it is you guys like, and then what do you do? You step to the side while it's being made, and God forbid you could be quiet for two seconds. You get your phone out, don't you? And here's the daft thing. You look at this. People get their phones out, and they don't get their phones out with just one hand when they're in that kind of environment. They get them out with two hands. And they're looking at the phone like this. Now, if you remove the phone from their hands when they're in the position, they've now got their guard up. So when you approach someone and go, hey, how's your day going? You're intruding on their Facebook time. They've now got both fists up holding the phone and their body language is telling their head, hey, we're being defensive. They will scowl at you. And so we would take them down there and say, you've got to instigate a conversation. See how well you do it was appalling. Our guys tried really hard, but out of probably the 30 people that were up there, maybe about four conversations happened. Now, you joked to Luigi about our age. Do you remember the periods where you were waiting for a taxi or waiting for a bus or waiting for a train? And what would you do? You talked to the person next to you that was also waiting for the train, wouldn't you? No, Steve, it's not what I did do. It's what I still do. I, 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 it's, it's, it's inculcated in us. But you're onto something, Steve, right? Because life imitates art or, or art imitates life. Who knows? Yep. So where is business and sales going? If everything is this micro transactional um, burst of communication, um, is the showroom salesman, is the car salesman a thing of the past? Is everything an Amazon transaction? Can you buy anything and everything in that quick burst of social media exposure? Let me add something there too, right? If you see a lot of large corporations are actually don't have phone numbers listed on their websites anymore. It's the craziest yep. thing in the world because they don't know how to train people to speak to their clients or they're afraid they're going to say the wrong thing and lose that client. So I understand. I see exactly where you're going with this, Steve, but I want you to answer that for Luigi. So one of your questions with the transaction, are we going to be able to buy anything online? The answer is yes. We're obviously moving into that kind of environment now where yes, you are going to be able to buy absolutely everything online. Even when the houses start moving from the escrow and the title services onto blockchain, you're going to be able to do every transaction you want online. Yes. But are you going to want to? Now, you said, is the, uh, the life of a salesman, the car salesman, a thing of the past? And here's a funny way of answering that question. Hopefully, yes. And I say hopefully, yes, because for those people to be successful, get back in the past. Okay? Back in the past, you wouldn't jump on a client. You'd be like, hey, how you doing? What made you come in today? You know, what do you look for? How can I help you? What's your lifestyle? Do you really need a car that can do 200 mile an hour when you're just going down to your local supermarket? You know, what's what's the purpose of the, of the purchase? You know, we ask questions. People today are frightened of challenging the customer. And whenever I have a client, and here's a classic one, if anybody texts me 
or sends me a message via social and go, hey, I see you in Austin, or I see you in New York, or I see you in Los Angeles. We should get together for a whiskey. I always respond with the exact same response. Why? And that terrifies people. That absolute, I get two responses every time I put that word out there because then I won't do anything else. I'll either get that, oh, I heard you were caught. Cool. Oh, you know, you sound like a prick. You're arrogant. Blah, blah, blah. And they get very confrontational with me. Or I'll get people going, hey, that's a good question. I've got this project I'm doing or I'm working on. And they'll answer the question. But when a client comes to you and asks a question, you've got to, you, you've got to go, hey, I'll do this. I'd like to give you an example with the story, if I may. Uh, a coaching client of mine is a realtor. Is that okay? So I was coaching her. She was a, a, an up-and-coming uh, realtor. She's very successful now. She used to sell really cheap homes. And I told her, hey, it's the same eff effort to sell a $300,000 house than it is a $3 million, So stop wasting your time. Let's get you in there. And we started focusing on how she should communicate with people working on those houses. And she phoned me up one day. And she was beside herself. She's like, oh, Steve, I know it's not my coaching time, you know, and, you know, I don't know what's going on, but I got this client. I had to speak. I said, look, break it down. What's going on? She said, I got this woman contact me and she wanted to buy a house in this street for this, uh, for this budget, three bedroom. Th and she gave the, the, the specifics of the house. I said, okay, and what did you do? And she said, well, I found every house in that neighborhood. for." I said, there, you went wrong. That's the first, you went wrong. And she went, why? I said, the first question you should have asked her is, why that street? Why that many bedrooms? Why is a pool important to you? You know, it's not offensive. You know, I'm asking, you know, why is that important to you? You know, okay, great. Then let's, then let's look for that, you know. But what you did was you engaged in a transaction. You became Amazon for three seconds. I want toilet roll. Here's toilet roll. You joke about there's no phone numbers. Try and phone up Amazon today and go, hey, I'm thinking of changing my drilling cleaner. Which one should I buy? There's no number. You can't contact anyone. So I said to her, go back to your client and say, hey, I apologize, but I've done you a disservice. You asked to get into this street at this budget, these parameters of the house. Why? So she did. She went back to the house. And the lady said to her that she was born just outside of town. And her mum would drive her to the shopping mall, drive her to the grocery store, drive her to school sometimes, and go out of their way to drive down this street because this street was where all the successful people lived. So as this girl had grown up and she was now a very successful IT woman, she went, I want to complete my journey by buying the house on the street that my parents always thought was where successful people lived. Now, I don't care where you come from. If you've come from anywhere and you've been there for 10, 15, 20 years, you know that those streets, those it streets, they've moved, haven't they? The shithole just outside of town is now where all the trendy people live. So when she knew the core, the reason, she was able to almost ignore that street and provide her where the successful people live today. This is where they are. First house she showed her, she sold. She did to ask why. But Steve, you touched on something really special there because the real estate sector has been almost disrupted for 15 to 20 years for exactly the reasons we've stated today, you know, that, that micro burst of communication. But it, the Foxtons and the other companies that have converted, have tried to convert this elegant um, sale into a commodity have always had difficulty because the communication is never smooth until now. Because now you've got the technology, you've got the videography, you've got the imagery. So I, I gotta tell you, I think real estate could be one of those sectors that is prime for this transactional, because at the end of the day, a one bedroom is a one bedroom and uh, a, a, a lakeside is a lakeside. So with the proper technology, th that can occur. You know what, Luigi? I don't know if I agree with you there, right? I think there's going to be a price point that serves, but always not a higher end price point that know your customer rule, know what they want, what they desire, and where they're going is never going to be commoditized. Because one day you may be selling real estate, which could be today. But you know what? If you know your customer and you can always generate some type of value for them, they may not be in the market to buy something right now. But in Steve's case, as he started out as a doorman at one nightclub, he said to them, Hey, by the way, Mr. Jones, have you heard of this club up the block? I can get you in if you want 
let's go and have a drink at the bar, possibly, and let's have a 30-minute conversation. Something along those lines always creates value, in my opinion. I think we're actually, we're having a conversation from the wrong side of the fence, okay? So you're talking about entrepreneurs and business owners, but now what we're talking about is the customers, okay? The customers are always going to want ease. So the idea of they need a one-bedroom as a quick overnight because they're working near Silicon Valley, then yes, they can very easily go online and do that. It's our job to get them offline and into a conversation. That's where we've got to get involved in them. And you can do this just because that's searching. And this is where technology works for you. A lot of people are using technology to replace you. Use it for you. You can have a client going online and looking at a certain property and you can reach out to that client going, hey, I see you've repeatedly gone back to the page on my website to look at this. Okay? And I wondered... Why are you looking at this problem? I'd love to have a 15-minute conversation that I could offer you some other options. When is a good time for us to talk? And actually install yourself in that conversation. Install yourself into that client experience and journey. Because if you can say to the client, hey, I know you're looking for a one-bedroom, and I know it needs to satisfy these kind of things, but I will tell you, if you could just travel three more minutes, that area is booming. That area is fast and uh, uh, up and coming. You'd get a greater rate of return by being two minutes outside of town than you would be by being one minute next door to it. Is that a consideration? Now you're given advice and value that the person can't get. You see, the internet today has sadly made uh, millions and millions of people stupider because they think they know everything because they can Google that shit. So, Steve, tell us a little bit about Sims.media. How's business evolving with you? So while I was doing the concierge work and dealing with some very, very powerful people, I ended up working for um, the first really, really big deal I got was the New York Fashion Week through IMG. So I started uh, helping market, brand, promote. And then I got involved with companies like Tiffany, Piaget through the luxury business, major hotel brands, um, Formula One in Monaco. And I didn't like the way they were marketing. So they were bringing me and going, oh, can you look after our high-end clients? And I'd be like, yes, but you're talking to them weirdly. Have you ever noticed, especially back in the 90s, that you'd walk into like a, a high-end auto store or an art gallery and the person greeting you was freaking British or they'd put on a stupid British accent and be like, good, <laughs> good afternoon, sir. How are you? It's such a pleasure to see you in here. And they would like treat you like there was you were the they were a butler to you or something. Really rich people are poor people with a lot of money. Talk to them like normal people. Hey, you want the best experience to go to Monaco Grand Prix? You need to be there, not over there. You need clarity of message and you need to be focusing on the client's needs. And I was saying to them, you're marketing these things wrong. You're marking them to a, a generation of affluent people that doesn't exist anymore. The richest people in the planet today are people that never graduated from school. They actually invented tech companies or, or agriculture or, or, you know, land. They, they weren't that way up. And now they want to be spoken to like a real person. They want to know what is the point of being here. So I started teaching these companies, these major luxury brands, how to communicate with today's affluence, today's mentality of the value within what they're spending money on. And so that's how it worked. I was helping them. And then I ended up working for Sir Elton John's Oscar party, uh, fashion weeks, Formula One, uh, art fairs, all over the planet, literally all over the planet, from, from Macau to Stad to, to Palm Beach. Um, and I started teaching them. And then I started teaching entrepreneurs how they can best fine-tune their message. And I wasn't really thinking of it. And then suddenly we realized we'd actually invented a media company. And while everyone was going, well, you've got to do these click funnels and you've got to do this and creating like a transactional flow, we were interrupting that and interfering with that and going, okay, when they do this, you phone them. When they do this, you send them a postcard. You know, when they do this, Send them a book. It doesn't have to be yours. Here's a quick tip. If you're looking to get your clients into a deeper relationship with you, send them a book. Now, you may not have written a book, and I suggest if you have written a book, don't send yours, but just go, hey, Jimmy, 
I was at an, a, a seminar or I was listening on a podcast or I watched this interview and the guy, girl was absolutely fat. They've got a book. I just thought you may enjoy it, you know? So I've just sent you a copy. Just that tiny little thing that shows that you are thinking about your client. Text him. You know, someone comes in and goes, hey, I just got a message. Um, this is Steve. I'm texting you from my home. If you want to arrange a call, then just let me know. Or if not, just push dial and I'll answer. Just do things differently. Disrupt what everyone else is doing. The media that people were doing five years ago, hell, that's not relevant this year. That wasn't relevant three years ago. You've got to change things. And what you do today has to be changed in six months. 12 months, 13 months. You've constantly got to be adapting the way you reach out and communicate and engage with your clientele. So we launched Sims Media about two years ago. And then, uh, funny enough, you brought it up. Um, we launched the full services of Sims.media today. And so we've already got about, I think it's 37 clients. Um, and we're very excited that we're going to help entrepreneurs get their message out there in the way that they should be and not the way they have been. Steve, I got to tell you, I really feel for you. A man like you from East London ending up in Southern California, how do you how do you coexist every day with that Southern California realities? And also, are there any good fish and chips down there? One, actually, funny enough, the Malibu Seafood Restaurant out on the PCH. Um, but yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird old thing. Uh, I created a life where I could live anywhere. And I travel a lot. Uh, you know, I had to be in Florence to see clients the other week. And, you know, pity me. I had to fly all the way over to Italy and pull up with four days with some wonderful people in Florence. Um, so California just became the place that I wanted to lay my hat because I knew I never had to worry about putting a rain jacket on. Um, Los Angeles has some funny people. But, you know, you can you can choose not to kind of hang around with that weirdo crowd. But it's a, it's a tough, tough act. But, hey. I'm resilient and I'm going to push through. So, Steve, let me ask you this. Since you travel so much, what's your favorite place to be at? Oh, the next one. Um, sad, sadly, you know, I, I love Florence. Fiorenza, I, I, I absolutely love it. Uh, I love Asia. I love traveling over to, to Ginza and, and Tokyo. I love travel. Finding someone else's culture, beliefs, you know, the way they interact – um, it is beautiful. You can't get it just by staying put. So I think travel is fantastic. And I met a guy once and I was in Rome at the time and I was at a bar and, um, which has been known to happen. And this guy <laughs> suddenly starts having a conversation with me and I didn't want to have a conversation with him. I, I was thinking of something else and, you know, I, I didn't want to talk to him and I went, Oh, you know, so, so where you, where are you traveling to next? And I just wanted to throw a stupid little question so he could keep talking and I could ignore him. And he turned around and he went, oh, I don't know. I've been everywhere. And I remember at that time thinking, that's got to be the saddest thing that anyone could ever say. I would hate to have been everywhere. You know, I want to constantly find new places as they evolve, as they grow. So I love Bangkok. Um, I love it. I love uh, um, California. I love Utah. I love uh, just traveling and finding different people and different cultures. So I'm constantly on the move and, you know, just died because of COVID. But, you know, I'll be out. Steve, I have to ask you now because the irony is pretty thick. As a proud Brit moving out of Britain and loving to travel, What's your take on Brexit? Um, I don't know if I can say the word raging morons, um, but I think Brexit was the dumbest idea that any any idiot, and I'm trying to use politically correct, stupid. What were you thinking when some moron went, hey, let's leave a, a, a group that can help us, and as the smallest country in the planet, where two other elements of it, Scotland and Ireland, and even Wales is trying to split up with you, you got to realize you did something stupid. Yeah, it's sort of counterintuitive. The whole world is globalizing. They're sort of becoming, they're sort of internalizing. Odd. Yeah, the British, we're not known for being, uh, we're not known for playing well with others. We're quite stubborn and still stuck in our ways that we used to control the planet and, you know, the, uh, the conquering kingdom of Great Britain. But... Um, Let's be blunt. That was generations ago. Steve, we have to ask. You've had a wonderful career to date. Things are thriving. What does uh, Sims 2.0 look like in the near future? God, you were saying you're thriving. It's as though it's over. Um, do you know what scares me? 
uh, and a friend of mine actually came up with this, and this is what's kind of propelled me all the time. If we if we gauge my life by wealth, family, friends, integrity, credibility, I'm happy. If we gauge it by finances, I live up in the hills. I can you know buy what I want. I'm happy. But entrepreneurs are there to be challenged. And I remember a friend of mine, Joe Polish, once said to me that the definition of hell is to meet the man or woman that you could have been. And so I sit here now going, okay, I'm happy here today, but this won't be good enough for me in six months' time. I would have had to have tried something. I would have had to have failed. I would have had to have pushed myself. I would have had to have stretched myself. The idea of being in the exact same position today, and even during COVID, we had the choice. I read more. I developed more. I did more reach outs. I did alternate ways of marketing. I tried more things. A lot of them failed. But you've only got to get it right once. You know, that is as simple as that. You've only got to win the lot of you once. And all the other ones, are, you know, that was practice. So I constantly try to, to um, challenge myself to do things different on a constant daily, weekly basis. I love that. Absolutely. If I, I'm a big believer in it. If you don't get out of your comfort zone is the day you start dying, right? The day everything seems okay and there's nothing to look forward for to. Like me and my wife's a big, wife are big believers and we actually constantly book a trip. So we have something to look forward to. So we're doing this day in, day out. We get up every morning. We enjoy what we do, but we're constantly looking for new things and working on ourselves within to keep growing because we're big believers. And the minute that stops is the day you start dying. Do you know, the funny thing is I want to help entrepreneurs out there. Challenging yourself doesn't have to cost you a lot of money. Now, Matthew, you say about traveling, okay? Let's be blunt. That costs thousands of dollars. But you can challenge your mind to look, conceive, and perceive things differently by just the, the easiest and, in a lot of cases, free things. One of the things that I do is one of my favorite little programs is I think called My Tuno. It's like a radio app, Okay. And I will literally just scroll through to find different countries and I will select different stations and I will listen to that station for one hour. And the other day I was listening to a crack out radio station on EDM. Okay. And because it was Poland, it was probably like two o'clock in the morning. And I listened to that Polish radio station doing EDM for one hour. Okay. And I just challenged myself to listen to a different culture, different music. Now, I'm now educated that this is the worst music known to mankind <laughs> because I went through it, okay? But had I not tried – I know what Polish EDM's like. It's, it's awful, <laughs> but I tried something different. It didn't cost me anything, but it taught my mind, hey, we're going to try something different today. And you could try driving home a different route. Another little thing that we do that my kids used to hate that they absolutely love now, I would go to a restaurant and we love Asian food. We like Thai food, Chinese. We like all these Indian food. We like all different kinds of foods. We would always pick something on the appetizer that we couldn't even pronounce, you know? And the appetizer, you know, that's like six bucks or nine bucks, okay? You can't come out of Starbucks spending less than that nowadays. So we would go to the menu and we'd go, okay, what looks weird and funny here? What what the bloody hell is this? We'll order this, please. And we'll order, we'll order that appetizer. Now, this has meant that I've had some of the worst things in my mouth that ever should have <laughs> not been in there. But it, it, my kids were like, why did you get that? You know, we always like the dim sum. We always like, why did you try? Because every now and then you'll discover something and you go, oh, my God, that's really nice. I can't pronounce it. Now, as my kids have grown up, and they've left home. When we go to a restaurant now, they fight over who's going to order the weird appetizer because they want to challenge themselves to try something different. And we went for my wife's 50th to Japan. I can tell you, Japan is not the place to play that game. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, thank you so much for being here with us today. You've taught me a lot. I know the listeners got a lot out of this as well. But before we do let you run, I do have a question for you that we ask everybody on the show. What does success look like to Mr. Steve Sims? 
avoiding being stagnant. We've already had this one. Just constantly trying, constantly growing, constantly feeling, being alive, in, in you know, actually involving yourself in stuff. So it's constant discovery of what I can do. Steve, you're amazing. Can you tell the audience where they can find you and how they can get in touch with you? Because I'm sure you're going to have a lot more followers and questions thrown at you after this one. Just be prepared <laughs> to answer why if you reach out. Yeah, exactly. You know, make sure the uh, the questions are interesting, but I do like to handle my own uh, answers. Yeah, you can grab me on Steve D. Sims, D for dashing, one M in Sims, stevedsims.com. But Steve D. Sims, is that's the place I use everywhere. So whether it be Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever, Steve D. Sims, and you'll find me. Thanks so much, Steve. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, everybody. That's a wrap. We'll see you on the next episode of the Liquid Launch Project. Thank you for listening to the show and make sure you subscribe, leave a review and share it with a friend. We'll see you on the next episode of the Liquid Lunch Project.